For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 2A. As I mentioned in the previous video, Stellar Physics 1D, we're going to have to take a few videos to overview some thermodynamics. We're doing this because in order to understand what's going on in stars, you need to have a solid foundation in thermodynamics. Other topics like quantum physics, gravity, nuclear physics, particle physics, we can tackle them as they come along. But with thermodynamics, we got to start off with the good base. So in this video, I'm going to go over the Landau potential, statistical ensembles, and Bose and Fermi distributions. I'm not going to derive every thermodynamic result in this video super rigorously, as this is ultimately a series on stellar physics, not thermodynamics, but it is important that you can see at least where some of these quantities come from. I've rated the physics level in this video as advanced, because in my opinion, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics are the most difficult thing in all of physics. Not because they're particularly difficult mathematically, you just need to know calculus. But conceptually, it's very non-intuitive and can be very challenging to wrap your head around it. So let's start off with some basic thermodynamic results that you may have learned in an intro thermal class or in high school. The energy of a system, which I'm calling U, is given as the negative of the pressure times the volume, plus the temperature times the entropy, and plus the number of particles times the chemical potential. And this is a sum over I because this is for each species of particle. So this I designates a given species. And phi here is the chemical potential for a given species. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that the change in energy of a system is negative PdV plus TdS plus phi dn. And again, you got a sum over all particle species. So this first term here is the work done by the system. The second term represents the heat flow, either in or out of the system. And this last term represents the energy change of the system due to particle flow and or creation and annihilation of particles. So for example, in the case of stars, this would account for the energy released by nuclear fusion. You start off with some hydrogen. When you fuse hydrogen into helium, you reduce the number of hydrogen nuclei and increase the number of helium nuclei. And in the process, you release energy. And that's what this term is. Note that if we take the total derivative of the energy to get the energy change, there's missing terms here. And so that implies that this sum here must equal zero. This, these are the missing terms from when we take the total derivative of the energy that are not found in this equation for the net change in energy. This doesn't come up that often, but this is actually a good equation to have or a good relation to have in your back pocket as it can be useful. We can now read off from our energy equation the following quantities. The pressure will be the negative partial derivative of the energy with respect to volume while holding entropy and particle number constant. So in this definition of energy, the natural variables are volume, entropy, and number of particles. And so you can see if you hold S and N constant, then these terms, when you take a derivative, are zero, and all you're left with is the partial with respect to V, and that will give you negative P. So that's why we have a negative sign here. We can do the similar thing for temperature, where we take the partial derivative with respect to entropy while holding volume and particle number constant. And we can get the chemical potential by taking the partial derivative with respect to particle number. Again, this is for a given species, so these really should have sub i's in there. This last expression for phi helps us understand what the chemical potential is. We can see here that this is the change in energy as you change the particle number while keeping entropy constant. So the chemical potential is the energy required to add one particle to the system without changing the entropy. But it turns out that this definition of energy, while it's perfectly sound, is not always the most useful one. So instead, I'm going to define a new type of energy, which is called the Landau potential. So this is going to be the total energy minus Ts minus Vn. And again, this is a sum implied here. So when we look here, what that is, well, that's just going to be negative PV. And in this case, we're going to take the natural variables for this potential to be volume, temperature, and chemical potential. 
The reason we're doing this, for one, is that entropy as a natural variable is not very practical to use, as it's not very easy to measure, and it's not very easy to deal with mathematically. Temperature and volume, however, are easily measurable. The chemical potential is not necessarily easily measurable, but we're going to see in a little bit why this is actually more useful to use as a variable than the particle number. So now we can read off the following quantities from this definition of the potential. The pressure will be the negative of the partial derivative with respect to volume while holding temperature and chemical potential constant. The entropy will be the negative partial derivative with respect to temperature while holding volume and chemical potential constant. And the number of particles, again for a given species, will be the negative partial derivative of the potential with respect to the chemical potential while holding volume and temperature constant. Next, we have to find what the Landau potential is. So let's take a look at statistical ensembles for identical particles. Particles can be in a given momentum state, and associated to that momentum state is going to be a given energy. For a particle with a given chemical potential, it turns out that the probability of being in a momentum state P, which is a vector, this is bold P to signify it's a vector, which has an associated energy E sub P, is proportional to what's called the Maxwellian weight. So this quantity, E raised to the E sub P minus the chemical potential, all divided by the temperature, this is called the Maxwellian weight. I'm not going to derive this, so we're going to just take this as a given. So here you can see why it's more useful to use the chemical potential, because it shows up in this Maxwellian weight, or this probability of a particle being in a given state. Now this result is for one particle. So the probability that you have n particles in a given momentum state P will be this probability multiplied n times. So that gives us that the probability of there being n sub P particles in a given momentum state P will be the probability for one particle raised to the number of particles. So that just ends up multiplying this exponent up here by the number of particles. Now since this is proportional, or since the probability is proportional to this quantity, the actual probability will be multiplied by some factor, which is called 1 over z sub p. Okay, so this, this is just a constant. But the probability of all possible occupation numbers has to sum up to 1. So if we sum the probability over all occupation numbers, we can set that equal to 1, but since z sub p is a constant, we can pull it out of this sum and just bring it over to the other side to find that z sub p is the sum of all the Maxwellian weights over particle occupation numbers. So let's think about what we're doing here. We're just adding up all of the different ways a particle can be in a given state and saying that the probability of all possible ways has to equal 1. The Landau potential for a given momentum state is given as the negative of the log of z sub p times the temperature. This is a standard thermodynamic result. I'm not going to derive this from first principles, but you can at least check that it holds. As we already found that the negative partial derivative of the potential with respect to the chemical potential must equal the number of particles. So if we take a partial derivative of this quantity, recall that z sub p has a phi in here. So you can take this partial derivative, and that has to equal the particle number. But the particle number is just the sum of each occupation number times the probability of having that occupation number. So this p sub n sub p is this probability right here. So in reality, when we say the particle number n sub p, what we really mean is the expectation number of particles. And so you can check that if you take this partial derivative, you'll in fact get this quantity. This doesn't prove that the Landau potential is equal to this quantity here, but it's at least a sanity check. Now this is the potential for one momentum state. And in a system, you have a whole bunch of momentum states. So if you want the total Landau potential for that system, you have to sum over all momentum states. In the continuous limit, this sum over p will turn into an integral over p. 
In order to convert the sum into an integral, you need to know what the density of states is. Well, you need to know the momentum density. And that's given by quantum mechanics. I'm not going to derive this, but you can get it just through unit analysis. We know that in quantum mechanics, the momentum of a particle is given as h divided by its wavelength. Now here I'm using h bar, which is h divided by 2 pi. So that's why I have this extra factor of 2 pi here. And the units of h are momentum times length. So if I cube that, I get momentum cubed times length cubed. Length cubed is just volume, so here we have a differential volume. And momentum cubed is like a momentum volume. Recall that momentum is a vector in three dimensions, just like position. So it's completely analogous. So we're here we have a differential momentum volume times a differential spatial volume, and then divided by momentum cubed times length cubed. So plugging this in to our expression for the Landau potential, we get the following integral. I've tacked on an extra factor g here, which is called the degeneracy. This accounts for if there's more than one way a particle can be in a given momentum state. So for example, many particles have something called spin, which tells you their magnetic moment. And that magnetic moment could either be pointing up or could be pointing down. So in that example, in a given momentum state, you can put your magnet pointing up or your magnet pointing down, and so the degeneracy is two, because there's two ways to put it in a given momentum state. This is just an example. In principle, g could be any positive integer. It just depends on the system you're looking at. Now let's take a look at this integral. z sub p here, which is this quantity, this sum right here, has no spatial dependence. So this integral here just integrates out to the volume. And so this gives us this final form for the Landau potential. The next thing we have to do is find z sub p. And this will depend on the particulars of the system and the configuration you're looking at. We're going to look at two particular cases, what are called fermions and what are called bosons. And these are two kinds of fundamental particles. And the only difference between them is that in the case of fermions, you can put at most one fermion per momentum state. Whereas in the case of bosons, you can put as many as you want in any momentum state. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please be sure to like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a few friends. So let's start with fermions. Like I said, the occupation number can be at most one for each momentum state. That means that n sub p can be either zero or one. This is not accounting for the degeneracy. So writing down our expression for z sub p, which was this sum of Maxwellian weights over all occupation numbers, we only have the possibility of n sub p equals 0, right here, or n sub p equals 1. And e to the 0 is 1, and then we're left with the second term here, which has a factor of 1 here in front of the energy. And that's z sub p for a given momentum state for fermions. We can now plug this into our equation for the Landau potential, and all we have to do now is integrate this. Now this integral over momentum is a three-dimensional integral. But the only momentum dependence in this integrand is in the energy, which is a scalar and does not care about direction. And so the angular part of this integral will simply come out to 4 pi. So we can write that down with our factor of 4 pi here. And here we have the remaining part of this d3p is just going to be dp times p squared. Now I'm going to integrate by parts, recalling that e is a function of p. And I'm going to take this term here, and I'm going to integrate it, and I'm going to differentiate this logarithm. And when I do that, I get the following result. So the p cubed here comes from integrating p squared, and this 1 over z comes from taking the derivative of the log of z. And then we have, with the chain rule, we have the derivative of e with respect to p. And then you just have to keep track of all your negative signs. Now the most general form of the energy is given as the square root of the mass squared times the momentum squared. And so dE dP will be the momentum divided by the energy. So we can substitute this into the integral. Now I'm going to do a change of variables to make everything inside the integral dimensionless. And I'm going to do this by taking every energy quantity and dividing by the temperature. So here we have x, which is what we're going to integrate over, is going to be the momentum divided by the temperature. 
epsilon will be the energy divided by the temperature. And recall, this is now a function of x. Eta will be the chemical potential divided by temperature, and mu will be the mass divided by temperature. And this will give us the following integral. So all we really have to do to make this change of variables is look at the powers of energy in the integral and convert that to powers of temperature. So here we have four powers, plus one is five, and then there's an energy on the bottom, so it's four, so we just multiply by a factor of temperature to the fourth. And now I'm going to simplify this by grouping all of the constants in front of the integral into one constant alpha. I've left a factor of three in the denominator because it's a convention to write it this way. And so now we've derived the most general form for the Landau potential for fermions. A quick note here, the factor g is called the degeneracy, but eta, which is the chemical potential divided by the temperature, is often referred to as the degeneracy parameter. So don't confuse the two. Now let's derive the Landau potential for bosons. As I said, the only difference between bosons and fermions is that in the case of fermions, you're limited to at most one fermion per momentum state, whereas in the case of bosons, there's no limit to the occupation number for a given state. So let's write down what z sub p is for bosons. Recall, z sub p is the sum of the Maxwellian weights for a given occupation number. So since there's no limit, you can have zero, or you can have one boson, or you can have as many as you want, all the way up to infinity. We can rewrite this sum as the Maxwellian weight raised to n sub p. But this is just a geometric series in the Maxwellian weight. And since each weight has a value less than or equal to 1, this comes out to 1 over 1 minus the Maxwellian weight. Now that we know what z sub p is, we can write down the potential for a given momentum state. We can get the total Landau potential by summing over all momentum states, or integrating in this case. And now we're going to follow the same procedure as we did with fermions. We're going to integrate by parts, and we're going to change the dimensionless variables. And when we do this, we get the following expression for the Landau potential for bosons. The only difference with fermions is that in the case of fermions, this was a plus, and now it's a minus. And that minus sign can result in drastically different behavior between bosons and fermions, particularly at low temperatures. Let's now summarize what we found for Fermi and Bose distributions. We just derived the Landau potential for bosons and fermions, where this plus minus here refers to whether it's a boson or a fermion. If it's a plus, it's a fermion. If it's a minus, it's a boson. Don't forget that these quantities inside of the integral have temperature dependence. We can now apply the relations we found in the beginning of the video. The pressure is just the negative partial derivative of the potential with respect to V. Well, that's pretty straightforward since we only have a factor of V in front of the integral. So taking the derivative just means we divide by V and then we multiply by negative one. The number of particles was the negative of the partial derivative with respect to phi, so the number density will be the same thing divided by the volume. I prefer to use the particle density rather than particle number because that's usually more useful. Now you got to be careful here because the phi dependence is actually in eta. So a derivative with respect to phi is 1 over the temperature times a derivative with respect to eta. It may not be obvious how I went from this term to this term, but if you take this derivative and then integrate by parts, you'll end up with this integral. The entropy, if you recall, is the negative of the derivative with respect to temperature, and if I divide by volume, I get the entropy per volume. This derivative is a little more involved because there's a lot of terms with temperature dependence. You first have a temperature dependence out in front of the integral, then epsilon has temperature dependence, and so does eta. And recall that epsilon has a mu in it, which has a temperature dependence. But when you carry it out, you end up with five terms, you integrate two of them by parts, you combine everything, and you get the following result. We can sum all of these terms to get the total energy density, which will also be equal to the integral of the particle number times its corresponding energy. 
and you can check that these in fact are equivalent. And finally, since we know the particle number, we can convert this to a probability density. In the next video, we will look at some applications of these results as they apply to stars, as well as some limiting cases. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified for the next video in the series.